بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله uh, I'm not going to completely sabotage what's just been said but I was just wondering if we could just uh, hear a few reflections from a dear friend of mine brother Kim uh, who's a convert, he embraced Islam uh, some time ago and he's from a place called Sweden which nobody knows about. We have this joke because like two days ago for some reason he thought that Sweden had this giant empire and then we looked at the map and it was just like <laughs> Alhamdulillah, taking over the hearts inshallah it's the best I could do <laughs> so yeah what we, you know, I just want to hear a few reflections because uh, as we said, it was a discussion. You know, hopefully, I can try and elucidate on some of the meanings and share some of the the things that kind of come come to mind in regards to this title. I think it's a very intriguing title, and I'd really also like to start as we mean to go on. So, to pass the mic, inshallah, for a few moments to our dear brother Kim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. I know uh, you haven't asked for me to uh, be here, <laughs> but alhamdulillah, I'm here. And uh, I haven't asked to speak, but uh, I've been asked to speak anyway. So, inshallah, <laughs> this is, uh, it's an honor to be here. And this is a very important topic that you have chosen. Um, and at first glance, I'm, it really comes down to what do we consider the meaning of life and how is life built? What are the, the cornerstones of, of this creation? And uh, mercy is all we have. And if we can't recognize that, we're in trouble. Like this is... Uh, it's really like being, being a human being as we know it is failing. That's all we do. Like that's, and that's how we've been created, more or less. So seeing it as a mercy is, a, is actually a, a way to stay sane in a crazy world in, in one way. Or, yeah. So alhamdulillah, I'm really glad to be listening to Musab on uh, this uh, topic and to clarify all these things, uh, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. I don't, I don't really know if I have anything more to add to this, inshallah. Well, you set the bar pretty high. Now we have to unpack the meaning of life. I don't know how if half an hour is going to be enough time to do that. Uh, but inshallah, we'll, we'll try and go through it together. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So understanding failure as mercy. One of the things, just as a kind of a methodology, what I don't want to do is just kind of sit here and relate a number of factoids that are kind of somewhat... Uh, intellectually stimulating and we all go back and forget them at some stage maybe you know after we have an evening meal or when we wake up in the morning so some of us it might be a day or two but I wanted to kind of just um, share some principles that perhaps we could take away with and apply in our lives um, you know which are effective and have an element of longevity so one of the things that, uh, you know, coming from a, a, you know, we're people that have inherited a legacy, um, a tradition, a path, and by implication, we're, we are components upon that path. We are people who are walking upon that journey. And we all share that same path. It's different in terms of our pace, in terms of our, the diversions or the detours, you know, in terms of that which we see upon the past, but we're all, you know, as Muslims, uh, bound because we're heading to the same destination. Sometimes it can be challenging to kind of, uh, 
really internalize and experience what that destination is, perhaps even uh, intellectually to apprehend it at some level. But at the end of the day, were we to take some time out and think and understand about what it means as to where we're going, we understand as Muslims, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. We are from Allah. We are from our Creator. We are from our source. We are from Him. Wa inna ilayhi raji'un. And often that's translated, and, and to Him we shall return. Shall is almost just kind of, you know, with sofa nardia. You know, in the future, at some point, way later, something when I've planned everything, I've done my hajj and I've made toba and I've done this and I've, you know, my kids are happy, they've gone through education, then I'll go back to Allah. But that's not what is said. What is said is, wa inna ilayhi raji'un. And we are right now returning. Raji'un. In Arabic, this is the fa'al, raji'a. It is the doer of the verb, meaning you are now in the present tense, in this state of motion. Right now, every single one of us. And there's no choice. The choice that we have, وَهَدَيْنَاهُ najdain. We've guided the human being onto two paths. Now, we can accept and embrace that motion. Or we can reject and ultimately harm ourselves and go against this friction. But there are implications to whatever choice that we make. And that's one of the things, you know, we can, we can listen to guidance or, you know, even from an ethical perspective. But at the end of the day, it's our choice. At the end of the day, it's our choice. But those choices are not without implications. So we hear frequently, many of us may even say this, it may slip at the tongue. The tongue, we're not actually actively apprehending what we're saying. We're not truly conscious a lot of the time, but we may be saying things this, like, this, well, it's my life. This. I can do what I want. Absolutely true. That's very true. But that also doesn't mean that those choices will not have implications. Now, in understanding this, um, I think it's very important that we have some kind of coordinates in order to just ascertain what does it mean? What are these two paths? So understanding failure as mercy. As part of an inherited tradition which has been preserved, we have access to relate things back to uh, ancient wisdoms and ancient knowledges. And often the paradigm by which we're able to, uh, or the template rather, we're able to place this upon represents itself in the Arabic language. That is the tool for, the, for much of the preservation of our tradition. How would you translate? Who, who can speak Arabic here? Who's learning Arabic? MashaAllah. You're Arab? Okay. MashaAllah. No? Nobody's learning Arabic. How can you not learn the language of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Huh? Kind of. Some nervous Arabic learners. You should learn it. Like, don't put yourself down. Like, it's a great opportunity. It's like a key. You know, Not having Arabic is kind of having, like, you have a door and there's like a window and there's all this cool stuff going on on the inside. And the key is saying, go and take it. Like, yeah, I'm nervous about it. Just take the key. And, you know. People can experience this deen without the medium of the Arabic language, but at the same time, if you have the opportunity, Bismillah. Why wait? So in the Arabic language, how do you, those people that had their hands up, uh, if you have your head halfway, halfway, does that mean you're like kind of part-time? Uh, no? How do you translate failure? Because the English language is really interesting, particularly the way it's off, it's very fluid. Not that the Arabic language isn't, but it also has this kind of uh, sacred rooting in meaning, you know. There are many sciences within the Arabic language. It's so incredible. How do you translate failure? Huh? Okay, let's start with one. Fashada. Okay, khasara. So khusran or khasara. 
Okay, fashel. Okay. Many words, we have two. Yeah. yeah? Interesting. Anyone else? No? I think that's what came to my mind initially, where I did like doing an immediate translation, I would think khasara. Khasara. Yeah? How would you do it? You're, where are you from? From Yemen. What part of Yemen? Hadramaut. Fein fi Hadramaut. Huh? Okay. Where in Hadramaut? Mashhad. Habib Ali bin Hassan al Atash. Okay. MashaAllah. Hayab al Sayyid. So, Fashal. That's another word, but it's also, it gives a different type of understanding of failure. Okay, let's make things easy. How many people can speak English? Nobody. Okay, we need a translator quick. Rescue that, because it is going to be... Yeah, Abdurrahman? <laughs> so how would you... Tra give me a synonym for failure. Let's explore this word. Words are interesting. Because they have connotations and they have implications and they have, you know, within a different context, it may mean different things. Who can give me a synonym for failure? No budding authors or writers in the audience tonight? No? Too tired? Huh? Failure. Failure. Loss? Yeah? Loss? Did you say loss? It's, I think it's good. I would agree. Failure or loss. Very interesting. Okay. Anything else? Pardon me? Disaster. Okay. Yeah. What an utter failure. That could be like, what an utter disaster. You have to do it with that English sarcasm in order to give the full kind of effect. Okay. Anything else? Sorry? Doom. It's getting pretty intense. What time is it? Nine o'clock at night. Inshallah. What day is it? Monday. Mistake. Interesting. Anything else? Defeat. Nice. Wow, this is getting interesting. Anything else? Sorry? Do you want the microphone? I really can't hear. You. Demise. Nice. Very good. So we've had what? Loss, disaster, doom, defeat, demise. <sighs> Anything else? Error. Nice. Trial. Interesting. That's interesting. I'd say that we're kind of we're going through to a slightly different, you know, uh, kind of semantic kind of field there. Anything else? Flop. Nice. Yeah. Flopping is mercy. Anything else? We done? No? Everyone's like, come on. That's interesting. So the, the overwhelming predominant uh, you know, uh, suggestions in the, in the audience tonight from you guys, would you agree that these, were, these had kind of negative connotations? Every single word. Loss, to lose something. Oh, I love to lose things all the time. It's the best thing that ever happens to me. You don't say that. It sounds odd. Doom, well, doom and gloom. Failure, well, we had failure, that's in the title. What was the other one? Demise, yeah, a kind of like, kind of, someone's demise, it was their demise that they fell from fame or that they fell from this kind of great. Who's doing that? Abdurrahman, what are you doing? Is that me? I'm just, can I blame you? No? Okay. So all of these things have negative connotations. Interesting. In Arabic, khasara, I would also say has a negative connotation. Personally, what I took from the title, and I may be completely off, is subject for discussion. Because I think if we want to understand things, we have to first have some definitions of what we're looking to understand. Because we're all thinking of things on a whole and we've interpreted it in a multitude of ways then we're going to reach, reach a multitude of answers and maybe that's not the answer that we wanted. Okay. So, 
failure, I think the interesting thing, loss, maybe that's not quite so negative, to lose something in one's life. Because we're also placing this within a broader context. Typically in the English language, because it's not one which is imbued now with Islamic, with, you know, it's not, it's not the, 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 the capital, the main language within a quote-unquote Muslim land. So the connotation when loss is made, it's, it's, it's understood through a different paradigm, a different world view. The idea of loss. But, but to lose something, or have something rather, let's flip it, taken away. Because who's taking away now? You see the difference in paradigm? Because we don't believe that things just get lost. We believe things are removed, just as they are placed. Or they are, you know, they, 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 they're drawn out or they're introduced into one's life, into one's experience. Okay, that's a very different world view. Where does that come from? Who's doing the introducing? Who's doing the pulling away? Who's, doing the, who's causing the loss? Who's causing the arrival? Where is this from? As Muslims, we believe that this is rooted in the divine decree. This is from Allah. So loss is mercy. Okay. If something's stripped out of my life, we, we often articulate is it something that we didn't really want taken out of our lives. Yeah? We're in agreement with that? We say it was a great loss to me. Sometimes we can reconcile by the understanding that it's from Allah and therefore it's this kind of, there, there must be a reason, which is a great sign of faith. But at the same time, it can be very heavy. So how do we approach this? The scholars say that there are two things which, if they are to be present within the heart of a human being, there is, there is nothing greater. There is no greater two traits to be found within the heart of a person. It's to have and we're going to unpack this. of Allah and of the creation. Husn comes from the word or it shares the same semantic field as Hasan, which means beautiful. Husn also means beautiful. Ihsan is also related to a, a refinement or a perfection, to do something in an exemplary fashion. Ihsan is the prophetic uttering, articulation of the spiritual tradition within Islam. Mal Ihsan. What is Ihsan? And ta'abudullah ka anna ka tara, wa innam ta kuntarahu, fi innu yarak. It's to, to devote oneself to one's creator as if you see him. How's our prayer going to be if that's our, you know, rooted within our hearts, if that's our experience? And if you have not reached that, that great, lofty spiritual state, then at least know that you're being watched, that he sees you. So what's called muraqaba, the state before it's called mushahada, and the state after it's called muraqaba. You feel as though you're being watched or monitored. So your actions and your words and even your intentions now become monitored. And this is a process which is initiated in the human being, a person, a salik, a seeker, in order for them to initiate that process and maintain that process of refinement so that they can become cultivated and begin to know their creator. So if we understand failure as something being stripped away, it's interesting because intellectually we can, everyone I'm sure is in agreement, we can kind of understand this. Okay, you know, I can appreciate that. It was hurtful that I lost such and such a thing or such and such a person. Because often it's not things that hurt. It's the loss of people. Because within a person is encapsulating, is encapsulated an experience, a memory, maybe even a lifetime, a relationship. And these things pertain to the heart. So when we lose people, it's often very, very challenging. The Prophet ﷺ, when he quote-unquote lost his child, or his child was taken away, Ibrahim, that 
he held him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this, this is very important that we understand how to interact with quote-unquote loss or, you know, uh, something being taken away. It's not to become heartless, but it's to appropriate those emotions that they don't become so damaging that we lose our way. He said, O oh, Ibrahim, and he looked upon him, and tears were falling from his eyes, but he wouldn't, he wouldn't weep. Like there'd be no kind of vocalization of that cry. But he would look down at his son who just died, and he, he was weeping. And he said, Ibrahim, we will indeed miss you. We're going to miss you, Ibrahim. And tears are rolling down the face of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, and we are, you know, we don't, we will, we will miss you and we're sad, but we don't say anything except that which pleases our Creator. That's the fiqh of dealing. You know, that, those are the principles which he taught, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his teachings in order to deal and the most, you know, with such, situa such situations. And what's interesting is if we look at this, we don't say anything except that which pleases whom? Rabbina, our Lord, our Creator. Why? Because inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun, and this is part of that those coordinates navigating back on a on a on a real path, a positive path. And what the Prophet sallallahu was doing here was empowering people. He was empowering us spiritually and emotionally to say that you you you, you don't have to understand this as failure, as in that it will destroy you. In fact, it may be the means to elevate you. In a similar situation, because we're dealing now with loss of human life or that being taken away. There was a lady who was at the grave of, uh, uh, and she'd lost, her, I believe, her husband. And she was, weep, uh, she was weeping. We could say it's a very natural experience. And the Prophet sallallahu said to her, um, you know, be patient, you know. And she said, well, you've not been through that which I'm, you, you're not, you, you don't feel with that which I'm feeling. Like, what, what do you know type thing? You know, and the Prophet was, was not callous or coarse. It would not have been said in a harsh way. We have to understand as a, as a default principle in our understanding, whenever we hear anything from the Sunnah of the Prophet it, it was beautiful. In fact, that's the very definition of beauty. There was no harshness about him. And this is, you know, attested to in the Quran. لو كنت فضلا غليظا قلبي لن فضوا من حولك. Were you to be harsh and hard-hearted, the, they would have fled from around you. No one would have, would have stuck around. Because it was difficult to be around the Prophet ﷺ in the context of, of early, the early Meccan period within these challenges and even within Medina to the, the aggressors from different parts of the peninsula. This was a challenge. It took you know, real faith and certitude in order to maintain you know, that connection. But the Prophet ﷺ was always gentle. And the Prophet ﷺ, upon saying, hearing this reaction, he didn't, he didn't confront, confront her because he realized at this point she was not receptive. So within this also is he himself, when his own child died, that he wept. And the, sunnah, the, the Sahaba looked on and they said, Ya Rasulullah, like, almost like, is this appropriate? Like, we see tears coming from, and the Prophet so he said, he said, Inna ha rahma. He says, this is, this is compassion. Like being, like understanding and acquiescing and even seeking a rida, although it may be in a state of pain, but of, of, of comfort in the divine decree does not mean that you become inhuman. In fact, it's a completion of our humanity. He said, this is compassion. Meaning if you don't cry, if, if you're unable to cry, there's actually something wrong with your humanity. You become this kind of callous robot. We need to be really careful of this. A kind of pseudo-religiosity. A religiosity was not rooted in the heart, which doesn't penetrate the soul. The great accolade when the Prophet ﷺ welcomed the Yemenis. You know, Atakum Ahl Yemen. 
هم أرقوا أفئدة وألينوا قلوبا They are brittle souls They have brittle souls Gentle souls And their hearts are soft He, he could have said it's an amazing place The, the architecture is splendid The, the, it's, it's the greenery in, in Taiz and around Zabi, the area where they came from. They're an ancient tribe. They're an ancient peoples. How would we define a people? Well, I've got this friend. They come from such and such a place, and they got this degree, and they're incredible. How did the Prophet وسلم, introduce this great delegation of the Ashariin, the people from Zabid in northern Yemen, which is so tragic because now, you know, that's really, you know, they're, they're undergoing a lot of challenges at the moment may Allah you know we mention them may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the blessing of this gathering um, grant them comfort grant them ease grant them respite inshallah and they're, they're in that position now it's not just something people's suffering is not reduced just to when they're on the news and we go back and then have a nice meal and they're still in that right now you know so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know lift all of those trials from them and, and grant them ease and respite and solace But when the Prophet وسلم, came to these people, and they're a special people, because whilst our, our tradition is not a racist tradition, it does recognize certain particularities about groups of people. You know, there are certain characteristics which people, different races and gen, maybe, and it doesn't mean that somebody can't go outside of, of the norm, but there are certain characteristics, and that's honored and praised. So when the Prophet وسلم, introduced the people of Yemen, He's, he, he chose, because there are many ways you could describe the people of Yemen, but he chose to describe them to that which is, was of meaning and that which was valuable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And almost like a subtle uh, encouragement for the Sahaba is you, you're to try and attain this from them and seek the reason why they're like this. You know, because he was a teacher in the Mabu'ith Mu'allim and he didn't say things haphazardly. Everything was governed, it was guided, it was, you know, it was under this divine, moved by the divine hand. They're soft-hearted. And this was something which the Prophet وسلم, saw as significant. So the Prophet وسلم, wept because he was the most soft-hearted of people. وسلم. But when this woman came, she came to the grave, she said, you know, you don't know, you've not been through what I've been through. You're not, you're not, you're not. You don't know what I'm going through. And the Prophet said, walked away. Because if you, you can't say, well, in the deen, you've got to believe that X, Y, and Z. No, the person is not at where they're at at that point. So just move back and pray for them and be a source of comfort. You know, some, someone's, um, I know somebody who lost a child and uh, some people that came up to him and they said, well, you can have another one. Th that's not the prophetic way. That's not appropriate. أعوذ بالله. Like I mean, it's true. But as they say, كلمة حق أريد بها باطل. It's a true word spoken, but what's really the implication behind it is actually completely erroneous. Well, you have another one; it's a big deal. You know, and the woman's suffering from vast hormonal uh, disturbance and trauma. And subhanallah, just go and have a heart. You know, because that's also something we're charged to do in the tradition. So. You know, alhamdulillah, the Prophet said him in his beauty, in his adab, in his manners, his courtesy, he was incredibly courteous. He went back, and people came and they saw this, and they said, like, do you not know who that is? Because she was just so engrossed in like, where she was at, she didn't even understand it was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You just said that to the Messenger of Allah? You just said that to Rasulullah? She was, right, I better go and sort that one out. So she went to the... Astaghfirullah, far too in English. English, the Arabs don't say that. Better sort that one. She went to the Prophet وسلم, and she, she begged her pardon. She said, excuse me, Ya Rasulullah. She said, I'll be patient. And he said, patience really comes at the first instance. Like, it, it, okay, I appreciate the apology. It's, it's not the apology that counts. It's I'm trying to train you out of love. I want you to reach great things. I want you to attain that mercy. And in this loss, you have the opportunity to, to, to ascend. To ascend something of your, even your own humanity. Because the default emotion is to become angry. Is to become, you know, you know to lose one's mind. You know. But 
I'm here to, 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 to offer guidance for your cultivation so you can be something meaningful, meaningful to your creator. That's, that was his way, sallallahu alayhi wa So that's in terms of human uh, loss, which I'd say failure is a mercy. It's very clear how we can see now how failure or loss can be understood as a mercy. I'd also like at this time to look into the word mercy. Mercy, how would you translate? Even you know, those of us that don't listen in Arabic or don't speak fluent Arabic, what would you say that mercy is a translation of? Rahma, I'd agree. Typically that's how people translate Rahma. Yeah? Everyone agree? So failure as, as Rahma. Okay. Are there any other potential ways we could translate Rahma? Compassion, I like that. That's my go-to word for mercy. For, not for mercy. For Rahma. Because I think mercy in, Eng, in English, in like certain circles, I think it's just become, we know that it's Rahma and we kind of have an inkling of what Rahma means. So we'll just, you know, whatever, mercy. But I think really compassion is, is far more inclusive and far broader because mercy in the English language is really kind of like, like I don't think a mother would show mercy to her child. I think a person that's committed treason against like some kind of, you know, medieval governor would, you know, he was like, how oh, shall I show, spare you my mercy? And that's the way, that's mercy because you're kind of at the behest of some kind of imminent, you know, you know whatever it may be. A contemporary example, I don't know. The, the, a lot of the classical books, they talk about kings and castles, and I've really kind of, kind of got to light up the kind of, I'm not going to say the White House, because then you get into all sorts of political kind of problems, and I just don't need that in my life right now. You know, just think something, you know, you know, random President A, you know, decides to pardon well you have this don't you you have this like somebody that's done something and you have the presidential pardon or the you know they're excused maybe because they're old and they've been to jail for a certain amount of time or whatever it may be but it comes at the point where you kind of really did do something wrong like i'm not pardoning you for no reason do you know what i mean and compassion is broader i love the technical glitches you know and the way it throws me off on a complete tangent in a, I think it's, it's interesting, subhanAllah. Uh, you know, so the idea of uh, mercy or compassion. Compassion, I feel mercy is contained within that. Are there any other words? Love. Mm, nice. Rahma. I think Rahma is implicit because, sorry? Like a blessing. Okay. I'd say it's more specific, it would be ni'mah. Ni'mah, like a blessing. But within, like, rahmah is a blessing. If we have compassion in our lives, that is definitely a blessing. I mean, from that perspective, absolutely. You know, the two are linked. Any more? Kindness. Okay. Rahmah. Maybe you could say gentleness. Gentleness, kindness. I mean, there are other ways of translating kindness and gentle. Gentleness is almost like lutf, to do things delicately in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a poised, gentle, kind kind of way. But also this, you know, rahma is such an incredible, incredibly expansive word. Um, when there are problems in translating, often you've got to go to more in like kind of older books and the dictionaries to look actually, well, what does rahma mean and where is it from? In the English language, if anyone is interested, it, it has translated from Arabic. It's, it's called the, the Lane's Lexicon. Really interesting work. And the person, he never embraced Islam, but he did this huge, I don't know if you'd even call it khidma, but he was put in khidma for the, to, do, to translate to the, these two books, these two dictionaries. And it talks, because Arabic's amazing. Uh, it comes from a very primordial place. And it very, like pre-modern, it's ancient, you know. So the idea of rahma, where did this come from? It has a root word. The idea you can have that in a language, to me, was so inspiring. It's like, how could you not learn that? You know, like baraka. Yeah, what does baraka mean? Blessing, yeah? It's a good translation. Baraka. But what does it come from? 
in the Arabic word, what it means is when, it, when it, a camel, which was everything to the Arabs, yeah, it, it, it comes down. A she camel, it, it, you know, baraka. It means, the verb actually means that the she camel comes down. So this idea of this great, valuable, worthy thing now descends. Baraka is flowing, you know, in the air. It's like descending. amazing, subhanAllah. Uh, another one is kataba. Where well, you get the word kitab. You have that in Malay, you know, you use kitab. Kitab means what? In English. Sorry? Scripture. Hmm. Any, any other? Oh. Scripture? Book? Yeah? Strictly speaking, what does ketaba mean? Writing? Hmm. Okay. So why does Allah say, إِذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ this is a book in which there's no doubt. And none of the, the, the Prophet didn't write it down. And it wasn't written to the Prophet. How is it a book if it's not written? So the Quran is what ultimately, richly translated, is, it's the recital. It's, it's, it's oral in its, you know, at one level. Kitab or Kataba comes from the same root as Jama'a. It's, it's, it's a compilation. It's amazing, the Arabic language. So you have all of these words which are placed, you know, in a certain way in order to what? Affect meaning. That's the purpose of language, you know. And that's why adab, which is what? To do things in the right way at the right time with the right person, you know, courtesy. The adib in the Arabic language is also the same word for an author, because the author, what? They can, they can place words in a particular way in order to affect an emotion, affect a meaning. So oh, incredible. Ketaba. It's also one of, I think, around 500 words in the Arabic language. If you flip it, if you flip the words on its head, it means the opposite thing. It means, like, to, you know, to fragment or to disperse. Subhanallah. What a sign. So, Rahma. Uh, is derived from the same semantic feel as rahim. And there's a hadith which alludes to this. What does rahim mean? Sorry? Womb. Okay. What does womb mean? It's interesting. In, our, in English we just say woman, men and women. But the, 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 the womb, the woman is the man with the womb. The womb man. You understand? It sounds a bit not very pleasant but like just run with me on it's actually an amazing thing meaning she actually has more you know there was a in Yemen there was this incredible lady called Sheikha Sultana Zubaydiya and she was a a, 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 a saint a, a scholar a poet uh, and they still recite her poetry today and her teacher was someone called Imam Abdurrahman Sagaf. And he had 13 children, all of which were incredible scholars. Um, you know. And they, he would visit her and she would learn from him. And sometimes there'd be this, the scholars have this amazing way. It's, you know, kind of like how rappers, sorry, it's, it's much more, it's much greater, much more refined. But rappers will kind of like have a battle to kind of test your, you know, how, how quick you are and all the rest. Scholars have something similar. Yeah, I'm really painting the wrong picture now. It's not like that. Get that out of your mind. I'm just going to like Eminem and they kind of like, <laughs> no, not that. But they, they, it's much more refined. They'll use poetry and they'll discuss things in order to, to like kind of like sharpen their acumen. You know, where am I at? You know, because you need two swords in order to sharpen, from one to sharpen the other. So they would say to her, like, what's this she camel? Like what she can offer, and we're all you know, young male camels. It sounds weird in our. I don't know how you'd say that. You know, like you're a male camel, you're praising yourself. It just sounds like it sounds like a diss where I'm from. But in Arab culture, we've got to understand the value of camels. It was everything to the Arabs. Because if you lose your camels, you've lost everything. You know, I don't know how you could make that into a contemporary, like because sometimes you can like interject a Ferrari in there. But in this concept, it's like, well, I'm the Ferrari. But it doesn't make sense because it's not masculine or fem feminine. So you get, you get the gist, though. Is everyone with me? Yeah, we've not been lost in the desert halfway on the way to... Good, alhamdulillah. 
So, you know, what is the, so this young she camel going to be able to do? And when we're carrying, we can carry great things. And she responds in Arabic, like literally, you know, I took you off the tip of her tongue, but it wasn't from a heart which was filled with ma'rif and a very, very keen intellect. She said, well, not only does the she camel um, bear the burden, she also gives milk and she gives birth to the men. Like touche, in your face, Yani. That's awesome. SubhanAllah, look at that. You know. So she is the, has the accolade of having the rahim which is the source of rahmah in our existence. You know. But if you look, and I don't want to be kind of inappropriate about it, but I think if we tackle this in an appropriate way, it's very important to, 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 to reflect upon. Birth is a very tr- one of the most traumatic experiences. That's just for the husband. Yeah? I mean, like, I've got four boys, and I'm just like, it's just, really, because you're like, and the, the guy's just so useless. Just like, keep breathing, it's like, what's that going to do? It's nothing at all. You know, but for a woman, I mean, one's, any man whose respect does not increase for his wife after giving birth, I don't like, what, you know, you've got something wrong. Because for somebody to do that is, is sacred. Amazing, subhanAllah. You know, and you can understand why paradise is under the feet of mothers because, you know, amazing. But in that trauma, in that trauma, through the rahim, which is the source of mercy, what do you get? Life. You get life. And you get this thing which comes out and it's kind of like, not that cute initially. The mother thinks it is because she's full of rahmah. You know, the dad, dad's kind of like, mm, I give thee a quicker than. Anyway, bismillah. <sighs> you know. But what's amazing is, you know, this, this source of rahmah coming from such a place of trauma. You know. So often what, the way we see failure, because nobody's ever going to see birth as failure, correct? But it's traumatic. But how can we understand it as mercy? You know, mercy being, you know, this word derived, and also the name Ar Rahman, the name of Allah, Ar Rahman. Any expression or symbol or sign or manifestation or that which we experience of compassion comes from Ar Rahman. You know, so if we see mercy, it, it's telling, telling us something about who He is. If you see love, if you see beauty, it's all telling you something. About, it's a signpost. That's not even the source. If you see something beautiful, it's saying, okay, well, this is just the signpost. What's the source? And subhanAllah. Now, I'd also like to, now we've, you know, explained, explored something about the meaning of mercy or compassion. Huh? Five minutes left. I'd like to, you know, think about kind of flipping it somewhat as well. Because a lot of the time in a, in a very narcissistic world whereby it is determined, your self-worth is often to some, any greater or lesser extent determined to how many likes you get or don't. We're reduced down to like dopamine, we become dopamine addicts. Just let me just check the Instagram. I know I only did it like five seconds before, but maybe somebody started to follow me. Weird, subhanAllah, as a sign of affirmation, you know, subhanAllah. But in that, this kind of world, how do we understand failure and who is it directed to? Because if mercy or compassion, as we know, is purely and ultimately only connected to the source, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how do we fail in the sight of Allah? That's what I'd say was the Arabic word, khasara, in the Quranic uh, you know, understanding is really a failure before God. It's not a failure to tie your shoelaces and trip out the door. That's, that's not a failure before God. Or it's not a failure to you know, you know, 
have a, de a demise in the sight of people. You know, to lose fame. Oh my God, I've lost my fame, my looks. And that's, not, that's not khasara. Correct? That's not, that's not the Arabs, it, it's, you know, khasarat. That's not how they'd understand it. it. It's more this really deep understanding of failure. Now, if we understand that as mercy, how can we fail? Ibn al Ta'ila Iskandari, one of the great masters of this tradition, a person of profound, penetrating insight into, how, in a, into this inner dimension and how we understand ourselves, he would say, How many a person succeeds or does something good and fails? And really slips in the sight of God, falls from grace. And how many a person fails by committing a sin or doing something? Fails, but it's actually a means for them to, you know, gain momentum on this, and get this trajectory towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what he's talking about here is our apprehension of these things. Sometimes Allah will, will place things in our lives. And it's not that, it's not all about us. It's about maybe our children, because our children need us to have a particular attribute that we can only attain through a kind of friction in our lives. Maybe our friends need us in a certain way to be, you know, to go through this, you know, like it, it's attributed to Rumi. I mean, if, if, I don't know the Persian, but the meaning is, 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 is wonderful. You know, if, if you're irritated by every rub, that was intentional and that was quite impressive. How are you ever going to get polished? So this idea that the rub is actually from a real source. You know, if we go through challenges in our lives, if we perceive ourselves as failing, because many people, I think they lose hope. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just a failure. Your failure is not even the point. It's how you use this to go back, to return back. And sometimes, often, like it can be, we can be at such a low point. The springboard is so, you know, it's it pressed so far down. People are like, Khalas, I have to change. So, in reality, rep, in rep, retrospective, were we to go through these moments in the in the eyes of God at the beginning, in the middle of the end, where was the failure? That was success. So we have to understand what do we mean by failure. Because our perception of failure could be one thing. The failure of God, ultimately, in the sight of God, is ultimately within our states for eternity in Yom Qiyamah. And here's the thing, none of us know that. We don't even know where we will end up, let alone the person sat next to us. What does that mean? It goes back to those two things that we started out and coming full circle. It, all of this ultimately comes back to our understanding of God. That there are two traits that if a person finds them, there are no two greater things to be found. Husna van billah. To have a, a beautiful opinion. Ihsan, we also said it's to do with a, a spiritual uh, proficiency or, or excellency or perfection. So to have a husn, beauty in your apprehension of the divine. To have a good opinion of your creator. And that takes work sometimes. That takes learning. That takes practice, spiritual practice. That takes spending time with people that can educate us, not just verbally, but experientially. They've tasted that and they can take us along that path. You know, the path isn't kind of like a flick on the switch. Oh, I've arrived. It's not, it's not, it's not teleporting. So Luke isn't about teleporting from point A to point B. Sometimes you'll be going through the same test time after time after time after time until God says, look. Because the first time you experience the test will not be the same as the second time you experience the test. There are different lessons that can be drawn. And if you look at this, it's a mastery. It's a divine mastery of which nothing fell out of place. Our failure is not God's loss of control. Do you see what I mean? Like, God, things didn't fall out of control. God did, never lost control. So the way we perceive it, we have to understand this. And the second thing is, to have a beautiful apprehension and perception of the servants of God, of the creation of our Creator. Because once again, if you, if, even if people seem to be, well, that seems like a failure. A person seems like a failure. That act is, a, is, is an act of 
someone who fails, you don't know their outcome. And we're charged and we're commanded. It's a spiritual, divine obligation in our religion to have a good opinion of other people. That's not just within the realms of people that testify La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Because you don't know those people that haven't yet testified to that where they will end up. Our religion is therefore one of beauty and perceiving beauty. As they say, beauty is in the eye of beholder. They say in Arabic, Kun jamin tara jamin. If you're a beautiful person, if your heart is cultivated, you will see beauty around you. So instead of the person coming into the mosque being cast aside because he's got an earring, who cares? He's in the house of God. He's in the house of Allah. And who brought him there? Allah. So, you know, you're not, you ain't even the host. You're representing, how are you welcoming the guest of Allah in his house? If a sister comes in and maybe, you know, the way she's dressed is not quite, you know, in accordance to your standards. Cool. It's not up to your standards. Invite them in with love. And here's the thing, typically people respond to that in a good way. You know, the Prophet ﷺ, in, in, in understanding, when he sent the people to Yemen as well, he, he taught them an understanding of how to... Because new Muslims, like, we fail a lot. We do things which are wrong. And sometimes they're not intentional. Sometimes they are. We just, it's just challenging. You know, and I think there are many things in our, in our lives that we just... We need a bit of slack. Do you know what I mean? So the Prophet ﷺ, when he sent the Sahaba, the companions, to Yemen, he said... Yesiru wala tu'asiru. Make things easy for people. Facilitate. Don't be a block. Don't make things difficult. Bashiru wala tu'nafiru. Be positive. Don't put people off. Where are we at with this? If we see failure in ourselves, we now have an understanding of how to apprehend this. It's a path, it's a journey. We need to seek more. These are, as we said, just some of the components, some of the coordinates upon this journey. And how do we apprehend the, the failure, perceived failure of those around us? Maybe Allah is showing us those things in other people as a wake-up call that we need to be a bit more supportive, a bit more caring. Yeah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, deepen this journey, unpack these understandings and these meanings further for us, connect us to the Prophet wasallam, and constantly renew our understanding of him, deepen our understanding of him wasallam, so we can you know, navigate this often challenging path in our lives in this world back to a place of meaning, back to our source. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Jazakumullah.